Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. My name is Pastor Ken, and tonight we're going to continue our lesson series on Jesus returning to heaven after the resurrection. So if you want to see the notes, click on the section that says notes below, and the notes will pop up. If you want to fill in the blanks, go and sign in with your Facebook ID, come back, and then you'll be able to fill in the blanks, and then print them off or whatever you'd like to do with them. And so let's get ready. Get your tools, get your pen, get your paper, get your uh, notebook, get your lesson, get your Bible. And it's getting spring, so you might want uh, some ice water or serve your coffee. Okay. Acts chapter 2. And we are going to look at the birth of the church, the birth of the church. So far we have looked at Jesus returning to heaven and we looked at choosing an apostle. Tonight in Acts chapter 2, we're looking at the birth of the church. Now question number one. We have said this a couple times already in our last couple lessons. The disciples were to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit and uh, you know, it's hard to wait, and uh, they were told to wait, and we must be patient. And Now, they did not know when that would be. Jesus didn't say, go wait for four days, ten days, twenty days. He just said, go wait. They did not know what to expect. They, What does that mean, to be endued with power? Their baptism in the Holy Spirit was a total surprise to them. They had no, they didn't have a clue what was going to happen. Now, that arrival was 50 days after Passover on the day of Pentecost. Now, today we talk about Pentecost and we think naturally, yeah, that's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Uh, however, Pentecost was a feast that the uh, Jews were to commemorate every year 50 days after the Passover. Now, the word Pentecost means 50, Penta 50. And so it was to uh, commemorate when the wheat harvest uh, was coming in. And it was the first harvest of wheat. It was also the barley harvest. So the barley harvest and the early wheat came in about the same time. And so the first wheat harvest and the first barley harvest of loaves, they, they would gather them. In fact, their ceremony was to take two bundles of uh, the wheat, cut them, wrap them, and they would bring them into the temple for their wave offering. And their wave offering was really interesting. They would take the sheaves of wheat and they would put them up towards the sky and back down, up and down, and then side to side. It was called a wave offering. And little did they realize that they were making the sign of the cross. And so those first loaves were given to the Lord as a uh, thanks that the Lord had allowed the rains to come and the harvest to be completed. Now, I've given you in question number two, if you get the lessons early, then I've given you some reading that will help with this lesson. If you haven't read it already, then this week you can go ahead and read uh, these uh, passages of Scripture. Now, question number three. Pentecost is a type of the Holy Spirit's coming. So the Pentecost, the feast, that's a type of the Spirit's coming. Passover was a type of Jesus' death. Remember how the Passover lamb was killed each year as a memorial for when they killed the Passover lamb in originally in Egypt. And after that, every year when they observed Passover, it was a type showing their deliverance from Egypt. And uh, it was showing that when Jesus would die for the nation. Now on the day of Pentecost, they were all in unity, all together, one mind, praying for the same thing, seeking the Lord. The unity of the church is its strength. 
So whether we are talking about years gone by or today or tomorrow, it is great when we are united. When one spirit binds the church together, the church is strong. Now, you know this is a principle of life, right? If you think about it, uh, if you're working someplace, if you're all uh, in harmony with each other, if you all have one purpose, one goal, the work goes easier. Uh, if you are moving something and uh, you're working together, you know, I've moved a lot of things and a lot of people over the years, and there are some people that are great to work with. You know, they, it's almost like they can read your mind. We're going to pick this up, put it over there, and they grab a hold of it and take it. And other people, you know, they, they, they just, they can look at the work and not see what needs to be done, or, you know, they, they don't pick it up right, or they just go this way or that way. But working together in a family, the same thing, when they're unity, working together, then we are strong. Now, let's look at the events of the, on, on the day of Pentecost in question number four. Uh, I'm going to read the first four verses of this uh, passage of Scripture, and I'm reading from the New International Version. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So, in this, what we just read, they were all in one accord, all together in unity. Suddenly, they didn't know when, and suddenly, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And there appeared tongues of fire over them, and they all began to speak in another language that was unknown to them. That was the miracle, that was the baptism, that's how they knew that they had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The languages were known to people from various nations. And so those people that were uh, filled with the Spirit and began to speak with, in an unknown tongue to them, they spoke and they praised the Lord, and those people that were from around the world, they understood them glorying, glorifying, and praising the Lord. Now, question number five. Speaking in tongues was not unknown to the Jewish religion. Many times in the Old Testament, we read of men prophesying. You will read it. Different prophets, different kings. It will say that they began to prophesy. The word for prophesying in the Old Testament is the same in Greek. In the Old Testament was Hebrew, but in Greek, in Acts 2, it's the same word. It means the same thing. For prophesying, it's the same. It's glossolalia, which is speaking in tongues. In the Old Testament, the experience was rare, but it was temporary. Here, the Holy Spirit continued to reside in the heart of the believer, and they were empowered to continue to speak in tongues. Now, this experience is still going on today. Every believer has the opportunity, if they call upon the Lord, and they want to, and they desire it, they can ask the Lord to fill them with the Holy Spirit, and they, too, will speak in tongues. Now, this tongue that a person may speak in it may be just like there in the, in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost. It may be that is, is a language that is known. Or it may not be a language that is known. We have no way of knowing. All we know is that it is unknown to the person that is speaking. And sometimes people you know, try to figure that out. And it's not about trying to figure it out. You're not going to hear 
the Lord speak into your ear and say, say this or say that, or you're not going to see it, you know, magically appear on the wall and you just re phonetically, you, you read it. No, you praise the Lord and, and you just begin to speak it. And that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to give two examples uh, right here. The, the first example I wanted to give, uh, there was uh, a man I met one time. And uh, he had, uh, his wife had passed away, and he was a retired sea captain. And uh, he was going to church, and in the church that he was going to, uh, he met a lady that uh, her husband had died quite a while ago. And, and so the two of them, they uh, struck up a relationship, and they eventually, they got married. Well, this man was new to Pentecost. And so uh, one Sunday morning, uh, there was a message in tongues, and then someone turned around and they interpreted it. So on the way home, this sea captain, he said to his wife, he says, that was really nice uh, that, uh, that Mary uh, praised the Lord. Uh, and uh, so his wife said, yeah. He says, well, it was really nice when John, when he praised the Lord, and then Nobody could understand what John said, and so Mary, uh, she, she told the congregation what he said. And uh, now, this lady, she'd been Pentecost for a long, long time, and she understood that, that was a message in tongues, and then the person gave the interpretation. Then it dawned on her, he said, what do you mean? He said, well, John, he praised the Lord in Hebrew. And he said, and then Mary, she, she told everybody what he said. Uh, now, uh, he knew Hebrew, okay? And <laughs> so he said, John said something in Hebrew, and Mary told everybody in English what it, what it meant. And, and so that is that was really neat that the Lord opened his eyes for that. Uh, later, another time, a friend of mine uh, wanted to speak to some people that... Uh, they were Hispanic, and he didn't know Spanish. But he felt the Lord prompting him to to tell them uh, about the Lord. And in English, they didn't understand what he was saying. And he felt the Holy Spirit prompting him to begin to speak in tongues. But he was kind of shy about that. And so anyway, there was someone else there that uh, could speak Spanish. And so... Uh, he asked that person if they would translate for him. Well, they started to translate for him. And, and as he's going, he just kept this feeling to, to, to just start speaking in tongues. And finally, he did. And he spoke in tongues as if he knew what they, he was telling them. And the interpreter just looked at him. And then he finally said amen. And he prayed with them and said amen. And... Uh, there were several of them that gave their heart to the Lord. And uh, so, uh, as they were going away, the interpreter said, now wait a minute, you said you don't know, you didn't know Spanish. And he said, I, I don't. He said, nah, he said, you told, you explained, the, you explained how to accept the Lord in Spanish just fine. You didn't need me at all. You're, you're pulling my leg. And, but he didn't, he didn't know. And see, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit like what was happening here in the book of Acts. Now, question number six. Passover gives pause to see our need of the Lamb of God. So as we look at Passover and we see the weight of sin, we need a Redeemer. Pentecost baptism causes the production of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not just about speaking in tongues. That's just showing that something has happened. But how do you live afterwards? And that's what's really important. We're going to see how it plays out in the life of Peter in a little bit. Now, in this passage of Scripture, it goes on to list some 15 different nations that heard these 120 people praising God in their native tongue. Now, four of the five recorded outpourings in the book of Acts, it mentions tongues. 
which is a replication or a pointing back to the speaking in tongues by the Holy Spirit. The experience continues today in the heart of the yielded believer. Yield yourself to the Lord. Now question number seven. They were all amazed. Verses 12 and 13. What does this mean? What's it mean? What's going on? Now this is not a small thing that happened in secret. There were 120 people. They spilled out into the street. The streets of Jerusalem were filled with people that had come for Passover and then they, some of them stayed, but others came back for the Feast of Pentecost and the streets were filled with people and worshipers and, and pilgrims going up to the temple. And all Jerusalem was stirred by this event. Just like the crucifixion that caused such a stir, this event made people's heads turn. Now some people that were in the street and they heard what was going on, they readily opened their minds and they believed. Now others scoffed at what they were hearing and they said, oh, they're just drunk. Uh, they could not deny this miraculous work, so they mocked it. Now, think about that for a moment. When was the last time someone got drunk and start, started speaking in a tongue that, that they didn't know? You know, like, do you know, do you know French or do you know Italian or do you know uh, Spanish? Uh, did just just start speaking that just like that? You get drunk and then speak it? No, that's not. It doesn't work like that. Now, let's look at Peter. Uh, Peter was a changed man in the last part of this chapter. And this is in verses 14 to 18. Uh, he lifted up his voice. Suddenly, Peter found his voice. Now, this is in sharp contrast. I'm going to show you some of that before. I'm going to show you Peter before this. Okay, keep that in mind. He found his voice. You know, sometimes people find their voice, don't they? They all of a sudden, they grow up. They come into their own. Now, Peter identifies what is happening here, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He identifies this as a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in Joel 2, 28 and 29. This prophecy, prophecy runs like this. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit. Parentheses is mine. This was the beginning. It says your sons and daughters will prophesy. Prophesy is to speak in tongues. Fifty days earlier, Peter had denied he even knew Jesus publicly. You remember that? He's warming his hands by the fire and a little girl says, you're one of his disciples. No, 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 no. That's not me. Well, now, today, suddenly, he finds his voice. Something has happened. Question number nine. Peter had cut off the high priest's servant's ear. Remember that? Jesus was being arrested. The soldiers wanted to know who were, you know, Jesus asked, who are you looking for? And the soldiers were looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Judas said he would kiss the man that was Jesus and Peter drew his sword and he cut off the high priest's servant's ear. Now, you know that he wasn't trying to just to cut the guy's ear off, right? He was aiming a little lower, but he missed. And what did Jesus do? Jesus picked up the man's ear and he put it back and healed the man's ear. Can you imagine that? Wow, how incredible. Peter did that because he was scared. Remember, Jesus one time was talking about how he was going to go up to Jerusalem and he was going to die. And Peter took Jesus aside and he rebuked Jesus. Don't talk like that. But now Peter recognizes this was the plan of God. Remember when Peter was walking on the water? What happened when he saw the wild wind and the boisterous waves and in Matthew chapter 14, what happened? He said, Jesus, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. 
And Jesus says, come. And he came out on the, and you know, but he got almost to Jesus when he saw the wind and the waves and he began to sink. That was, that was Peter before. What happened to Peter when Jesus was arrested? In Matthew 26, 56, it says that Peter ran for his life. He fled when Jesus was arrested. Remember the night before the crucifixion? Jesus asked Peter, James, and John, and he says, come with me and pray with me. And Peter says, yeah, I'll pray with you. And in a few minutes, he fell away. Okay. Not once, but three times. When Jesus rose from the dead, where was Peter? In John 20, it says that Peter was hiding for fear of the Jews. This doesn't sound like the Peter that we see in Acts chapter 2. Peter did not believe the women who reported back to him the resurrection. Remember that? Mary Magdalene comes and she says, the Lord is risen. He goes, yeah, all right. And he and John run to the tomb. because They know where it is. He didn't believe the women. He ran to the empty tomb, went inside of it. They looked. And he saw the grave clothes. And then he saw the, the napkin that was put around the head all folded up and laying right there. He was amazed. But still, hadn't found his voice yet. Peter said one time, after this, he said, I go fishing. Now, going fishing, you remember, Peter, James, John, and Andrew were all fishing, mending their father's nets. And Jesus came along and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so they left fishing. But now that Jesus has resurrected from the dead and they only see Jesus once in a while, what did Peter do? He said, I go fishing. That represented going back to his old life. Now, he wasn't saying, I'm hungry and I'm going to go, get a, going to go fishing to catch some food to eat. No, he was going back fishing to as work. Jesus said, no, 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 no. And Jesus asked him, do you have any fish? Remember the story? And they threw the net on the other side. And then when they got to shore, uh, Jesus was talking to Peter. And uh, he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I like you. Lord said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I like you. Now, you know, there's something wrong with that picture, right? Because if I said, if my wife says to me, honey, I love you. And then I look back at her and I say, I like you. Uh, that's not going to cut it, all right? She's going to, her eyebrows are going to scrape them off the ceiling. Okay. But see, Peter's the one that he had said just a few days, a few weeks earlier than this, he had told the Lord, I won't deny you. And then what did he do? He denied the Lord. So Peter, he's a little fearful here. Of He, he can't even trust himself in saying, I, uh, he can't say, I love you, because that's making a real commitment, because he knows that he's fickle, and he failed the Lord, and so, Lord, I like you. And then earlier, just in the last chapter, Acts chapter 1, Peter, along with the others, they wanted to know, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Not on the same page at all. That was the Peter before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now, Peter, bold, preaching to the crowd. He gives us a continuation of Joel chapter 2. Young men shall see visions. Now, we see this happening in uh, the book of Acts. Later on in Acts chapter 7, Stephen saw Jesus when he was being stoned, when he was the first martyr that Lot gave his life for, for the Lord. Stephen saw Jesus standing by the Father's right hand, welcoming him into heaven. So he saw a vision. Cornelius saw an angel. Remember that? The angel said, send to Joppa and look for one Peter. Have him come and preach to you. 
And Peter, he saw a sheep full of creatures that came down from heaven. And he looked at them and they were all unclean. And uh, the Lord said, rise, slay and eat. And Peter, oh no, Lord, nothing unclean has ever come into my mouth. And, and so the Lord was speaking uh, to Peter. You see Paul in Acts 16, Acts 23, and Acts 27, Paul had night visions. And time and again, the Lord appeared to Paul and gave him instructions. We've had incidents in the last 2,000 years that could fill books that the Lord has directed people in visions and in dreams to do this and to do that for the kingdom of God. The Lord is still speaking to us. Now, our last question tonight, question number 12. Jesus' death and resurrection gave life to the early church. So look at that. His death, burial, resurrection gave life to the church. The Holy Spirit gave the church power to preach the gospel. Peter now stands up boldly. How does he do that? Because the Holy Spirit has come into his heart and is living in his heart. They counted themselves worthy to suffer for Jesus. They bared their backs for the whips. And, and when they were beaten, they, they, oh, Lord, thank you. It was an honor to, to suffer for Jesus. When the, the chief priests, when they examined the disciples and they said that they were ignorant, that doesn't mean stupid. It just means that they, they hadn't been to university. Okay? They took notice that they had been with Jesus, okay? How did they, they knew that these men, by what they were preaching, they had been with Jesus. They knew what they were talking about. Their lives were now endued with power from the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus said would happen. He says, go and wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Remember, they didn't know what they were looking or waiting for, didn't know what to expect. But when the Holy Spirit arrived, they knew it. If you open up your heart to the Holy Spirit, when he arrives and comes in your heart, you will know it. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. We are so glad that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the change that it made in Peter's life, who was timid before and now boldly standing up to preach the gospel. But you said through Peter that this is for you and your children and your children's children, and many as are far off. So even, Lord, today, so we open our hearts and lives and we say, Lord, fill us, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for each one here today. I pray, Lord, that your presence would fill their heart with the glory of God. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Thank you for being with us. And we hope to see you on Saturday at Saturday School. Amen. God bless you.